So on behalf of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia, I'd like to welcome all of you here to today's event. And just to say how uh, grateful we are to have a representative from the Russian Federation who's here, who's going to talk to us. Other people are going to introduce him, and other people are going to introduce the people who are going to introduce him. But I just wanted to say on behalf of the Jordan Center how pleased we are to have you here today and how much we hope in the coming years to be able to continue the dialogue with representatives of the Russian Federation here at NYU's Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia. And we're looking forward to doing that in the future. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to today's uh, representatives from today's organizers. So Aziz, Josh, take care. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aziz Janazimi, and I'm the president of Model United Nations here at NYU. Today, we have a very special guest, Ambassador Vital Trikin of Russian Federation. And I just wanted to quickly introduce everyone to our series. Uh, this is an inaugural year where we're hosting ambassadors and foreign ministers. Our previous guests have included foreign ministers of Qatar, Libya, as well as ambassadors of France, United Kingdom, and a number of other countries. Today is the last event of Model United Nations in this academic year, and we're very pleased to be hosting Ambassador Trikin for this event. Uh, before we begin, and I introduce uh, Vice President Tom Ellett to uh, introduce the ambassador. I want to quickly introduce these speakers and the moderators for today. Uh, our first moderator is Nadine Shafak, who is the head delegate of our travel team, and Kirill Mazurin, who is a moderator for this specific event. So please give them a round of applause. <laughs> With that, I'd like to ask uh, Vice President Ella to introduce the ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. First, I'd like to take a moment to congratulate the Model UN. They have been an outstanding year of leadership of students bringing in wonderful speakers, so congratulations to the leadership of the Model UN. <laughs> Without further ado, we would like to welcome the Ambassador Turkin. He's been a permanent representative of the Russian Federation to the United Nations since 2006. Previously, he was Ambassador at Large at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation from 2003 to 2006. Ambassador to Canada, 1998 to 2003 the Ambassador to Belgium, and Liaison Ambassador to NATO and WEU from 1994 to 1998. The Deputy Foreign Minister and Special Representative of the President of the Russian Federation to the talks on former Yugoslavia, 1992 to 1994. Director of the Information Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the USSR, Russian Federation, 1990 to 1992. Ambassador Cherkin holds a PhD in history and is a graduate of the Moscow State Institute of International Relations. It is a pleasure to welcome you to NYU, Ambassador. Your Excellency, I'd like to begin today's discussion by first of all congratulating you and your, on your behalf, the Russian people, on the Victory Day, one of the greatest victories in over the past century, the victory over fascism. Um, so with that further ado, I'd like to begin with the first question, Your Excellency. So uh, recently we saw the Russian campaign of airstrikes in Syria and how um, that has led to the peace negotiations that are taking place in Geneva right now. What is your current assessment of the Syrian civil war and what are the prospects for peace emerging between the government and the opposition? Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for your congratulations, and uh, of course I'd like to echo those congratulations uh, because this was not just a victory for our country, but the Soviet Union. Of course, we were a part of anti-Hitlerite coalition, the United States, uh, United Kingdom, France, many other countries that set up uh, the United Nations when the war was over, so it's uh, our common and our joint victory. I am a little bit surprised how little attention is given to this uh, in the United States, but this is an entirely uh, separate matter. Now, coming uh, to, uh, to your very important question, you know, the, the situation in Syria has been allowed to, to, to degenerate too much. Now we see not only just two major uh, terrorist groups, ISIL and uh, Al Nusra, operating there, but uh, a number of uh, other groups, uh, they like, can be counted in dozens. Uh, they are not officially regarded by the United Nations Security Council as terrorist groups, uh, uh, simply because on many of them, uh, it is impossible to reach agreement uh, among members of the Security Council to the effect that they are terrorists. But, you know, they are cooperating with Al-Nusra, not really ISIL, but definitely Al-Nusra. They, they are using terrorist tactics. Uh, so now we fortunately have been able to establish uh, extremely close uh, uh, cooperation, practical cooperation between the Russian and the uh, American military. They literally discuss minuscule details of the map of Syria where fighting is uh, going on to make sure that the cessation of hostilities, which was introduced on uh, February 27, uh, is, uh, is maintained, even though uh, it is extremely fragile in some areas. It is particularly uh, sort of difficult uh, in the area of, of Aleppo, but at least uh, the, the common, the joint effort between 
uh, the Russian military and the American military uh, is there. So uh, now we have the best chance we have had uh, for the past five years of the conflict of uh, moving towards uh, cessation of hostilities, towards a political uh, deal uh, on Syria. Uh, for the first time in December of last year, we were able to pass a unanimous Security Council resolution in support of a political process in Syria. And it's not just a general support, it's a specific plan which spells out what needs to be done, six months for creating a, a governance, uh, including uh, people from the government side and the opposition working on a new constitution, and then within 18 months holding uh, elections on the basis of a new constitution. But of course, this is easier said than done. Uh, extremely intensive diplomatic effort. Uh, you, if you follow the news, uh, our foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, speaks uh, with John Kerry, the Secretary of State, on the phone almost daily. They have had numerous meetings, mostly focused on, on Syria. Uh, now there is another meeting of this International Syria Support Group being planned uh, for, for the 17th of, of May. There have been three meetings of this sort in the past a few months which sort of generated this political activity. For the first time we were able to put together, uh, to put uh, around this table uh, all the main actors because there was, uh, there was a very big problem in the first few years uh, when, uh, like for, for instance, the Saudis were refusing to sit at the same table with the Iranians. And Iran is a major actor in Syria. The Saudis have been supporting some groups uh, within Syria, so we believe it's important for them to start talking. And for the first time, this international Syria support group was able to, br to bring all the interested parties together. So this, another, this is another element uh, to suggest that maybe there is more hope than uh, we used to have before. But the fact that they are all sitting at the same table does not mean that they uh, work in the same direction. And this is, of course, a very big problem. We see that uh, those terrorist groups and murky groups uh, uh, are receiving very serious support, including military support. For instance, in the past few days, when a new offensive was started by Nusra, we saw them using tanks, we saw them using heavy artillery. So clearly that could not, be, could not have been the case uh, uh, if they were not receiving uh, rather in, uh, you know, heavy uh, assistance from abroad. So the, the situation, uh, again, is, is extremely, extremely complicated. But uh, everybody is tired of the conflict. I think now it hurts uh, uh, Europe as well, with the, those waves of migrants uh, coming from Syria, as well as, as from Libya. So there is an, an additional incentive, we believe, uh, for the conflict to uh, conclude. And also, of course, uh, for the people of Syria, it has been an incredible ordeal, which lasted uh, over five years. Uh, which caused enormous destruction, death, etc., etc. So we hope that now everybody sort of is fed up enough and that a certain mechanism has been created uh, for the uh, conflict to be uh, brought uh, to an end. I'd like to say thank you again, Ambassador, for being here with us today. My question for you is about what the Putin administration's strategic geopolitical view of the socio-political integration into the Eurasian arena is. Into what? The Eurasian arena. Eurasian arena. Well, uh, actually, I think I can address that, but I'd really appreciate if we stick. I heard you you're speaking about UN model. Uh, you're talking a guy who knows a number of things about the United Nations. So if we stick to the United Nations, I think it would be a more uh, useful conversation. But you know, we have uh, uh, the, uh, President Putin and others have made uh, a number of statements to that effect. This is a, a, one of the major, uh, major uh, directions of our foreign policy. Uh, we do believe in, in integration in, uh, of, of Russia and our neighboring countries. Uh, as you know, we have a Eurasian Economic uh, Union. Uh, and uh, we believe that there must be integration of integrations. In Europe, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, the European Union, of course, and uh, we believe that this is how uh, the integration uh, in the Eurasian uh, landmass should work. We believe that uh, it is really uh, sort of not the most productive policy uh, for, the, for the interests of uh, the countries to the east, for the European Union simply to try to, you know, uh, to bring in, 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 it, in, it, in its fold uh, countries uh, from, uh, from uh, Eastern Europe. Because economically, they are simply not prepared. I mean, the crisis in Ukraine, I mean, was brought about largely because of a move which, uh, in our view, was premature and which uh, uh, some Ukrainians, President Yanukovych was ousted, uh, came to realize maybe too late that it was premature for Ukraine. We believe it's better for uh, our part of the Euro-Asian landmass land to get better prepared 
uh, through reform, through in uh, integration, for uh, the integration of integrations, which uh, ultimately uh, we believe should take place between the European Union and, uh, and uh, the, you know, the rest of the Eurasian landmass, uh, that uh, to the east of the, of the borders of the European Union. Okay. Well, also on quite a general topic, um, I've heard it said that, well, conventional political philosophies like realism and um, institutionalism are not really thought of um, as integral in the Russian view of international relations, and rather that it, it is um, easier, perhaps, to describe Russian diplomatic uh, thinking as uh, following the westernizing philosophy, the great power balancing philosophy, and the nationalist philosophy. To what extent do you think this is true, and what can you comment on this? <laughs> you know, I've, I've never, uh, you're, you know, you're talking to a rather practical guy. I've never, <laughs> I've never, uh, I've never uh, thought uh, in, in, in those terms about our foreign policy. I think our foreign policy, speaking uh, about, uh, about the past uh, 25 years since the disintegration of the Soviet Union, it, uh, it went through uh, a number of phases. Uh, the first uh, phase, which now is uh, largely believed to be a naive phase by many uh, in Russia, was the idea that, uh, that uh, uh, we are here to be embraced by uh, major uh, advanced uh, uh, industrial powers. We are one of them, and uh, we are going to be there like one of the major democracies, uh, you know, global democracies, and we are going to work together. That's why we are moving uh, rather fast uh, towards you know G8 and ultimately became the member a member of G8, uh, and uh, the the whole thing was based on the idea actually promise, on which the Berlin Wall was uh, demolished, and on which the Cold War ended. There was a big uh, summit in Paris uh, in November I think in 1990, uh, which came up with a big declaration. I mean President Gorbachev was there, all the leaders, United States, Europe were there, and uh, basically the punchline of that declaration was. A common Europe from Vancouver to Vladivostok. Common Europe from Vancouver to Vladivostok. That did not happen, unfortunately. That did not happen. So, uh, even in a situation where naively we were hoping that you know now we are going to be treated as equal partners, uh, maybe even in the in the situation where our economy was struggling, some economic assistance uh, is going to be uh, provided. But it did not really happen. It, well, what we saw actually that, and there was another act, slogan, and what is where you can see. The competing philosophies. Uh, I, if you, if I look back at uh, the big discussions uh, on the margins of NATO, for instance, when NATO was beginning to develop partnerships with Eastern European countries, including Russia, we had this philosophical debate to try to uh, raise myself to, to to the level of philosophy. They were saying that NATO was the foundation of European security. We were claim, uh, saying that the Organization for Security and Cooperation in, in, in Europe, we see should be the foundation of European security. You see the difference. And unfortunately, they started, it, it was more than just a philosophical difference. This is where they started push, pushing things. So NATO started, sort of started uh, moving to the east. Uh, the European Union later on came with its own partnerships, which I already uh, referred to. So uh, Russia found itself in a situation where we felt that our, uh, some of our fundamental uh, interests uh, were not really respected to the point that the United States and you know, some others, up till now, are refusing to, what they say, to give any kind of legitimacy to any of integral integration uh, institutions which uh, Russia has created uh, after the disintegration of, not, not just Russia, but Russia and uh, other countries uh, from, the European, from the former uh, Soviet Union. I mean, uh, you, you may remember that uh, the, the disintegration of the Soviet Union came as a surprise to many. Central uh, European countries, former republics of the Soviet Union, were caught by surprise by this announcement coming out of uh, Belarus in December of uh, 1991 that the Soviet Union is no more. And there were numerous, continue to be, numerous links which uh, sort of uh, unite uh, our countries. That's why the Commonwealth of Independent States was created. Uh, some other um, in integration institutions were created. But what we see uh, is a categorical refusal uh, even in small, you know, small matters, like uh, a few months ago, uh, we, were, we failed to adopt an innocent press statement from the Security Council because the United States and some others were crossing out 
a reference to uh, some of those institutions, along even with uh, OEC and the European Union, sort of recognizing their presence uh, in Central, Central Asia. So there was, uh, there was an accumulation of problems uh, uh, we felt uh, in uh, our relations uh, with, uh, uh, with um, the United States and the European Union. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, it came to the fore uh, in, in, in the situation in Ukraine, and uh, therefore we find ourselves uh, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a bad place. To say nothing of other, I mean, think, to say nothing does not mean those things uh, uh, did not exist. We started with Syria, we saw uh, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, we, we saw the disintegration of the Libyan statehood in 2011, we saw uh, an attempted uh, similar operation in Syria. So there were other things uh, sort of outside of our immediate relationship um, uh, between uh, Russia and, and, and the West, if, if you will, uh, which, were, which were troublesome. So now I think the, uh, the, the, our joint objective is to, uh, for, to, to find some new modus vivendi, how, how we're going to, uh, to interact with each other. Uh, what my foreign minister Sergei Lavrov has repeated a couple of times, business as usual cannot longer exist. We cannot simply continue with the trends of the past uh, two, uh, two and a half decades. So I don't know if I you know, uh, went up to the level of, sort of philosophical comprehension of where we are, but at least I try to share with you my recollections of uh, you know, the trends of the developments of the past 25 years. Ambassador Churkin, you touched the issue of Libya, and uh, specifically in March 2011, when the uprising in Libya had started, a Russian Can Federation. Yeah, yeah, please, 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 Russian Federation did in, in back in March 2011. Uh, you know, I think what first of all, uh, the, the resolution was okay. So if the resolution was okay, uh, the vote was also okay. But uh, uh, the, the thing is that uh, they chose to, to break this resolution, to violate the resolution. Uh, the, the resolution is uh, about protection of civilians, and the first paragraph of the resolution actually proposed by our delegation was uh, immediate cessation, uh, immediate cessation, immediate ceasefire, immediate cessation of hostilities. Uh, but they chose to take the resolution actually in the, in, in the process of that, promising to the African members of the council, because they needed uh, their votes, that it's not about regime change, it's, it's just about protection of civilians. Uh, so, uh, uh, again, the resolution was okay, our vote was okay, we abstained because we knew that it can be abused. If you read my statement uh, after adoption of the resolution, uh, uh, you will see that uh, we, were, we were warning against uh, abusing this resolution, so they chose uh, to, go, uh, to go against the grain, to go against the resolution. And that created uh, serious problems, including uh, serious problems in our inability later on to adopt resolutions on the Syrian serious crisis, because uh, the trust was not there. And uh, they quite openly were telling us that uh, their intention was to, to do a regime change in Syria and to use the Security Council for a regime change. What we're saying in response is that it's not the charter prerogative of the Security Council to get engaged in regime change operations. If you want to change a regime, please go ahead and do it. This is what they've been trying to do, but without, uh, without uh, the Security Council. So this is my answer to your question. Ambassador, my next question is regarding EU sanctions, and specifically your thoughts on whether or not the EU will lift anti-Russian sanctions in the near future. You know, what we are not discussing sanctions. They made their decision, they introduced some sanctions, we introduced some countermeasures, uh, uh, and uh, when they feel like lifting them, I think they will lift them. Of course, they are hurting economically. I suppose we are hurting economically. We believe it's the wrong thing to do, but uh, when that's going to happen, we'll see. Ambassador, uh, in the recent years, uh, we have noticed that there is a um, significant increase of activity both around the North Pole and the South Pole uh, from every country. Um, everybody that can afford it is going to these uh, territories. And with the receding ice caps, um, the paradigms change in the security, well, globally. And also, it's uh, interesting to note that in the near future, well, 20 years or so, the agreements that govern the Antarctic region are starting to run out. And what do you think? What do you think we're likely to see in these directions? Do you think that there will be cooperation, or do you think these um, 
I guess, resources will lead to future conflict. No, there, there, there has to be cooperation, and also on, uh, on the subject of, uh, of the Arctic, uh, uh, and uh, generally speaking of the uh, oceans, uh, we do have uh, an international agreement when actually scientists uh, determine, uh, make some very important decisions on what belongs to whom. And there is a, a whole system within the United Nations, this commission on continental shelf, uh, when countries who claim certain areas of, of the continental shelf, uh, they simply provide their scientific, uh, scientific materials, proving that. And this commission actually considers those materials for a very long time, and then you know agrees that this particular part of the continental shelf belongs to Russia, or you know, say, you know, to, to Denmark, or Canada, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, recently, we got a very good positive decision of that commission on the Okhotsk Sea in the Far East, and now we made submission uh, several months ago on the continental shelf uh, in the Arctic uh, Ocean. So, you know, I'm a, I, I used to cheer the Arctic Council before I came here. I, you know. I think it's a fantastic uh, area with a lot of resources, a lot of uh, prospects for our future. Uh, you're absolutely right, there's global warming, it has many uh, negative uh, aspects to it, but it has some very positive aspects too, you know. I went to Yakutsk, for instance, a number of times where temperature uh, drops to 50 degrees centigrade below zero in winter. So it's rather hard to argue there that global warming is bad. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if uh, the northern uh, route uh, is going to be really open for uh, navigation, even for summer times, reliably, then it's going to give a great boost to our economy because it's uh, like 33, 34 days shorter uh, going from Rotterdam to Japan, for instance, than doing the Suez Canal and Suez Canal, all sorts of problems, piracy, the whole thing. Uh, not too many pirates in the Arctic Ocean at this point. So, <laughs> no, really, there are huge advantages. So this is another. I think enormous resource uh, for our country uh, looking through you know, the 21st century. Ambassador Chukin, so this year the United Nations will select uh, its new Secretary General who will come into term on January 1st, 2017. Assessing the work of Ban Ki-moon over the past um, terms that he served as United Sec Nations Secretary General, what would you like to see in the new Secretary General and what are the priorities that the Russian Federation will be pushing for on the agenda of the UN come 2017? I'd like to see new Ban uh, in, as a Secretary General because really uh, I, I really like him and uh, I think uh, uh, he worked well. You know, what does, you know, great uh, what does it need, for, I think, for the Secretary General? Uh, he needs to show some leadership. Some argue that maybe Bank has not shown enough leadership. But his leadership, uh, while he's showing leadership, uh, he cannot forget about the sinful earth. You know. if, if he runs too much ahead of the members of the United Nations, of you know, the countries who, uh, who are actually uh, making up the United Nations, then uh, he will be out there uh, running on his own uh, rather than uh, driving the whole, uh, the whole train, which, which is supposed to, uh, to, 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 to be there. So it's the ability uh, of the Secretary General to do things is actually quite limited. You know, most of the work which is being done by uh, the Secretary General or his special representative, uh, like on Syria there is a special mm -hmm. representative, on Libya there is a special representative, it is based on the decisions of the Security Council. If there are no decisions of the Security Council, he's absolutely powerless because, I mean, he is just you know, a, prestig a prestigious international uh, bureaucrat. So uh, he, he does not have any uh, leverage except his you know, job and office on the 38th floor uh, of the <laughs> building of the United Nations. Now, in fact, we have uh, a rather uh, uh, unhealthy excitement, I would say, in the building of the United Nations about the selection process of the new Secretary General. At this point, uh, we have uh, nine candidates. We are going to have more, I think, maybe 11 or 12 candidates. In late July, the Security Council is going to start its actually selection process for the new Secretary General to make its recommendation later uh, to the General Assembly, and the new Secretary General will be selected. It has to be a person who, uh, well, first of all, does not bend easily to various pressures, because pressures, of course, on the Secretary General are enormous from various quarters, including you know, from Russia and from uh, uh, other countries. And uh, he or she must remember that they are there to represent the, you know, the entire institution, not a particular group of countries, but the entire institution. So if they bend, or he or she bends in one particular direction, especially on uh, you know, dif difficult, controversial issues, then it might hurt the institution. So I hope uh, the next uh, Secretary General will show this, uh, show this backbone, uh, which would allow uh, him or her to, you know, to maintain that personal integrity. 
Thank you very much. So now we're going to move forward to the question and answer session of this of this. I discussion. thought it has been question and answer already. <laughs> <laughs> With the audience. <laughs> so uh, we'll receive dozens of questions for the ambassadors, so we'll allow you to have a chance uh, if you would like to ask a question. So uh, if I select you, please stand up, uh, introduce yourself, what are you studying, what is your name, what year you're in at NYU, and then you can ask proceed to a question. Please keep your questions very short so we can have more people ask questions. Uh, you can raise your hands now. Let's go with you. Um, hello, Esther. My name is Arisha. I'm a freshman here, um, studying politics. Uh, thank you again for coming. So my roommate is actually Russian, so Russia comes up very often in our room when we talk. Um, and actually, sometimes we talk about domestic politics. And with the upcoming American election, what candidate does the Russian Federation look favorably upon, if any? If any. Um, and, and you don't have too much of a choice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but but is there any are there any candidates that you look favorably upon, not favorably upon, or no opinion at all? No opinion at all. <laughs> <laughs> easy easy answer to a difficult question. No opinion. <laughs> next question. Let's go with you. Um, so just continuing on what you started saying about the next secretary general, uh, is there a, a consensus? Although, yeah, as as you said there's uh, more candidates that are expected to declare their candidacy, uh, that it's time for Eastern Europe to, to take the, I, although this is very informal, and there's no a rule that says that the next Secretary General should be from Eastern Europe, but is there a general agreement in the Russian mission? Uh, well, the, the Russian Federation, you know, we are a part of this Eastern European uh, regional group. We do have five regional groups in, in uh, when it happened, I don't know, but five regional groups. Uh, and they are mostly used in order to occupy various positions in, in, the, in the UN system. And uh, it so happened that uh, so far uh, there, there has never been a Secretary General from uh, Eastern uh, European region. And uh, so our colleagues from uh, this region are extremely <coughs> adamant that this is their turn. And uh, there was a letter which we also subscribed to, which was sent to President of the General Assembly some time ago, which express that position of the regional group. So basically, people do understand and sort of admit that this is a turn of Eastern Europe. But uh, you're, you're right, there is no formal rule to that effect. And also, in 2006, when Ban was originally elected, Vicky Freiberger, the president of Latvia, presented herself as a candidate. So now, Eastern Europe cannot claim that. You know, uh, It is exclusively Eastern Europe. And uh, there are already two non-Eastern European candidates, and they are very strong candidates. Uh, Mr. Guterres, the former Prime Minister of uh, uh, Portugal, who has also worked for a long time in the UN system. And uh, uh, Helen Clark, a former Prime Minister of New Zealand, who is currently the head of uh, UNDP, UN Development Program. So they are very strong uh, candidates as well. So we'll see how it plays out. Some countries simply say that uh, they, do not, they do not think much about this. Uh, a geographical rotation, but us being a part of that region, we have to be respectful of that. However, we are not ruling out, you know, the process is going to be so complicated, we are not ruling out that eventually somebody will come from, from outside the region. Okay. Next question. Let's go with you, Neva. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, thanks to the MUI uh, Club of NYU. Uh, Mr. Cherokin, uh, I had the honor of being you a few <laughs> times in the MUN. I assure you that was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, um, so a couple years back in uh, one of the simulations we did in London, uh, one of the delegates used a very interesting strategy. He had, this was a crisis, um, and what he basically did, he took the flags off his soldiers and sent them into a region he was trying to conquer and you know, washed his hands of the operation, which was a very interesting strategy because everybody else knew that they were his, but because they didn't want to get in trouble with them, they didn't do anything about it. And about a year later, we saw exactly the same strategy play out in Crimea, um, in real life, obviously. So um, you prepared at all? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I had been in, a, in any position of power, maybe the reaction would have been different. But um, what, I, what I want to ask you, Mr. Cherkin, is what really would have stopped um, any of the countries that reacted the way they did from reacting more militaristically. I mean, what would have stopped the Obama administration from putting drones over Crimea, for example? What would have stopped? The Russian uh, anti-air uh, defense? <laughs> <laughs> but 
Well, I mean, because uh, it is a cynical I mean, world. I'm sorry. Now, now we are. Uh, I mean, it's it's less. Uh, you'll recall back then um, the official line of the, of the Russian Federation is that they were not their soldiers; they were patriotic Crimean citizens or something to that effect. I know we, you know, we don't need to get into the propaganda of it anymore. But if if one of the other countries, one of the other powers, had reacted militarily. Would Russia really have come to the rescue there? To, to react militarily to what? To the situation in the Crimea? To, yeah, to the invasion of Crimea. There would have been a big crisis. Would have been a big crisis. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my view. Of course, it's rather difficult to, you know, to, uh, to, to speak about those things retroactively. But, you know, uh, you know, you can talk about this or that, various statements which were made, sometimes uh, more successful statements, I think, uh, better statements, sometimes maybe not. Uh, so. Uh, uh, effective statements, uh, but to us the important thing was to conduct a referendum, and it was conducted. You know, that there was a referendum, and ultimately, if you believe in the sort of the will of the people, that we the people principle, then this is uh, what is important. And uh, uh, pro you probably know that, uh, uh, like I think a year after that, some German actually uh, polling institution conducted a poll in Crimea. And the result was exactly the same. 93% of people were saying they were in favor of Crimea becoming a part of Russia. So, Yes, please, in the back. Uh, in the yeah. Russian discourse on its involvement in Syria, there's been this overwhelming focus on <coughs> terrorist organizations and branding certain groups as terrorist organizations to validate the use of force. But the Assad regime has been using the same types of attacks on civilians. So what justifies your backing, or Russia's backing, of the Assad regime? Well, first of all, I don't know if the uh, Assad regime, as you call it, uh, have been using, for instance, uh, uh, you know, suicide bombers. I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of the blowing up cars in the streets when dozens of civilians uh, die. They fight a, a very you know, bloody uh, uh, war uh, in, in cities. You know? They fight war in cities. And uh, I'm not justifying uh, you know, all, all the things they have done, you know, like their complaints about battle bombs, stuff like that. But they fight this war in the cities. And they fight uh, with uh, uh, organizations like ISIL, Nusra, and many others, uh, which uh, also use very you know, dirty methods. Uh, so it's uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, you, you can complain about all sorts of things that the Assad regime has done, but uh, I haven't heard even uh, uh, my American colleagues claim that uh, uh, the, the Assad regime is a terrorist organization, although, uh, but uh, uh, Nusra and uh, ISIL are terrorist organizations. Some others would rather brand as terrorist organizations, but uh, we cannot come uh, to consensus at that end in the Security Council. So we believe there is a difference. Yeah, you were in the back, yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I would like to ask, uh, I actually study in China. I'm not from, uh, I'm study away here. Uh, I go to NYU Shanghai. Um, and a big part of um, a big, uh, big upcoming thing in China and in, um, in these nations is uh, BRICS: um, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and uh, um, I think South, South Africa. Africa. Yeah. Um, do you see this sort of institution being developed into a military military block, no. Um, no. possibly? No. Because of um, India maybe um, sort of alienating itself. No. from Russia and moving towards the U.S. or some sort of... Not, not a military bloc, no. It, it originally started as like countries, uh, like developing economies, you know that. And then it added some political dimension because we have similar views on uh, a number of uh, political uh, issues. But I don't see it going beyond that. There are some economic pro programs, there are some development programs, there are some declarations and efforts to you know, come up with the same view on uh, various... Uh, uh, international issues, but no, it's not going to develop in, into a military alliance. And this is not the goal. And then let's face it, there are uh, certain differences, for example, between <coughs> India and China, which uh, make highly unlikely any kind of military alliance in the, for, in the format of BRICS. So just when I call on you, uh, make sure to introduce yourself. Uh, let's go with you in the second row. Um, I'm Nini, I'm a sophomore here. Um, how do you think Russia's occupational policy towards Georgia can be developed? Uh, Occupational policy towards Georgia. You know, there has been a long standing conflict between Abkhazia, uh, uh, South Ossetia, and Georgia. It all came to the fore in 2006 when uh, Mikhail Saakashvili decided to go in militarily and there were some peacekeepers, etc., etc. 
and we recognize the independence of those two countries. We are, we are not sort of occupying Georgia, we, uh, we are supporting Abkhazia and South Ossetia because it was, we felt, and they felt most importantly, that it was the only way to, uh, to guarantee their survival. Because since we, knew, we, we now recognize them and we have you know, a certain relationship with them, we have treaties which guarantee their security. So <coughs> this military adventure cannot be, cannot be uh, against them, cannot be repeated. Hopefully, in the long run, they'll work out their relationship between Georgia, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia. And you're not going to play a role in that relationship? Well, if we can play a useful role, we, <coughs> we will try to play. We will try to play a useful role wherever there is a conflict and wherever they are, want us, the parties involved, uh, want us to be helpful. We play a role, as you know, on Nagorno-Karabakh together with France and, uh, and the United States. We play a role even in relations between Ethiopia and Eritrea or Sudan and South Sudan, from time to time we play a role. So this is what we're trying to do as a big country, as a permanent member of the Security Council. So if there is a useful role to play, we'll play it. Moving forward, uh, let's go with you in the back. Yeah. I'm Alessandro, I study international relations and economics here at NYU. And you talked a lot about integration. So I would like to ask you if, in your opinion, an economic and political union with Eastern European countries would be something that is realistically desirable for Russia. And by a union, I mean an international political organization where each state is at least nominally the equal with each other. Uh, well, you know, uh, I think that uh, a relationship between all of European countries where each state is going to be equal to the other is what we need to, to, to strive for. But like you said, Europe, Eastern European countries, uh, they are already part of a different uh, system. They are a part of the European Union, they are a part of NATO, and we are not aiming at trying to sort of reintegrate them, to pull them away from uh, the Western European countries and try to integrate them in some kind of a structure uh, to which we belong. We are simply trying to, uh, you know, to uh, create, to make sense of uh, the relationship in our part of the world and also uh, to make sure that uh, we take advantage of, uh, of, of the many links which have existed for many decades and, you know, uh, which made us at some point in history uh, live in the same country, you know, the Soviet Union, which then disintegrated for a variety of reasons. So this is what we are trying to do. Incidentally, maybe uh, one point I need to make. Uh, I talked to once to one very smart and well-known uh, politician and diplomat and uh, I complained, as I try to complain to you, that like the United States is not recognizing, trying to create all sorts of problems for those integration uh, institutions that we have. And he said, maybe because uh, there is a fear that you force those countries into this integration. So I gave him one example. You know, one of those integration instruments is a Treaty of Collective Security. Uh, and there is uh, Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan. And then uh, when uh, this institution was created sometime in the 90s, Uzbekistan didn't want to join. They did not join. Then they decided to join. They joined. Then they decided to move out. They moved out. <laughs> then they decided to join again. They joined. Then they decided to suspend their membership. And we're told, no, thank you very much. Better leave. And they left. <laughs> you know. So <laughs> this is one example which shows that countries uh, participate only in those uh, uh, forms of uh, cooperation and integration they find uh, in their interest and they are not forcing anybody to do anything. The concluding section of the discussion today, uh, Your Excellency, is what we call the Marcel Proust questionnaire. So uh, actually there's a very famous uh, TV personality in Russia, Vladimir Posner, and he has a primetime TV show in Russia where he has prominent guests from across the world, including for example Hillary Clinton was on his show uh, in the past, and he asks very lighthearted questions at the end towards the guest to light up the mood and also receive guidance and, and a little bit of wisdom from the guest. And it so, was not his invention. So uh, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Invention. So the principle is that Marcel Proust is a very prominent uh, French writer who lived in the 20th century and he used to have a questionnaire uh, that he referred to when he interviewed um, his guests. So I'm going to ask questions and hopefully we'll go through them uh, in a uh, briefer manner. First question, Your Excellency, is who is your role model in life? Or who was your role model in life? You know, I, I've had the pleasure. Uh, oh, let me put it uh, briefly. I really admired Eduard Shevardnadze, mm -hmm. the foreign minister of the Soviet Union. I, I worked for him as press secretary and uh, then spokesman. Of, I was the last spokesman of the USSR foreign ministry, so I really admired him. 
What is your favorite book? I cannot, I mean, the role model is a little bit different. Uh, but <laughs> this, this was a guy with, for, for whom I worked uh, in a very important time in the history of the world. And I found that very satisfying. Later went on to serve as the president of Georgia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what is your favorite Actually, book? the last time I saw him, <laughs> <laughs> when he was, was, was president of Georgia already, and I came like on a private visit. It was very interesting. It was a very emotional time in Georgia's history when there were all sorts of high hopes, which unfortunately uh, did, not, uh, did not come to fruition. What is your favorite book and why? Oh boy, oh boy, my favorite book. <laughs> Can I think about it? <laughs> sure. It uh, it's easy to say War and Peace, but you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you had a chance to go back and live in the Soviet Union, would you? Uh, <laughs> you know, actually, I would because no, it, it depends on what you you know what what you want to to hear from me because I think that uh, the world would have been a better place and our all countries, almost all of them in the Soviet Union, would have been in a better position if the Soviet Union found a way of productive development, you know, really modernizing, really becoming a democracy, really using the advantage of its huge economic potential, unfortunately it did not happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, the world and our countries uh, lost uh, a lot because of that. So, but you know, there are other circumstances, I hope we're we are going to uh, move on in the current uh, shape of things, but it's, uh, I, I believe it has been very traumatic to many of us. You've had a very long diplomatic career and you've served and worked on many conflicts and issues. What is the toughest process of negotiations that you've gone through as a diplomat in your career? Toughest process? You mean an issue or...? or uh, toughest negotiations. Toughest negotiations. There were quite a few. Quite a few. Well, of course, you know, in my sort of uh, close association with all things, it was briefly mentioned that I worked on the former Yugoslavia, you know, mm -hmm. during the conflict in Bosnia. Uh, that, uh, I, said, I think, was, was very tough, very tough indeed. And there were some difficult times here in the Security Council, various resolutions, but those things cannot be compared because when you're sort of uh, involved uh, in this whole thing, when the conflict is uh, going on, it can be quite tough. What is your view of an ideal world? Sure question. Ah, ideal, ideal world. <laughs> when there is no conflict and there is more harmony, when uh, every, every person has an ability to sort of develop uh, himself or herself uh, to the fullest of, of their ability. We are a long way away from that. And final question is, seeing that there are a lot of students here today uh, listening to this discussion, what is one advice that you, you'd like to give us, the students? Oh, you don't need my advice. <laughs> <laughs> you have your own mind. <laughs> Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And Thank you very much. Please give a round of applause to the Ambassador. <laughs>